आज हम लोग बात कर रहे हैं प्रोफेसर डॉन्ग सिंह हान के साथ जो यूएस में पढ़ाते हैं और उनकी किताब द अननोन कल्चरल रेवल्यूशन पर आगे चल के हम लोग बात करेंगे हमारे हाल ही के दिनों में हम लोग देखे हैं कि नए राष्ट्रीय शिक्षा नीति के अनुसार 2020 में जो नई शिक्षा नीति आई है एन 2020 उसके बाद से एक के बाद एक बदलाव लाए जा रहे हैं हमारे शिक्षा व्यवस्था में हम देख रहे हैं कि सेंट्रल यूनिवर्सिटी एंट्रेंस टेस्ट लाया जा रहा है जिससे एक हिसाब से शिक्षा का केंद्रकरण किया जा रहा है हजारों प्राइमरी स्कूलों को बंद किया जा रहा है रैशनलाइजेशन और मर्जर के नाम से जिससे शिक्षा का निजीकरण हो रहा है सिलेबस में चाहे वो स्कूल के सिलेबस में हो या कॉलेज यूनिवर्सिटी के करिकुलम में हो एक के बाद एक बदलाव लाए जा रहे हैं जिससे आरएसएस बीजेपी के इतिहास को देश के हमारे सभ्यता के इतिहास के हिसाब से थोपा जा रहा है यानी कि शिक्षा का भगवाकरण भी किया जा रहा है तो ऐसे समय में जब हजारों छात्र युवा नए शिक्षा नीति और मोदी अमित शाह आर एस एस अंबानी अडानी के नीतियों के खिलाफ आवाज उठा रही है उठा रहे हैं और कलेक्टर भी उसी आंदोलन का हिस्सा है तो हम लोग बार बार उसी सवाल पे लौट के आते हैं कि विकल्प का रास्ता क्या हो सकता है कि एक वैकल्पिक शिक्षा व्यवस्था कैसी दिख सकती है और इसी के लिए जरूरी है हम बात करें कि इतिहास के उन एक्सपेरिमेंट्स की जहां पे एक दूसरे तरीके का शिक्षा व्यवस्था लाने का कोशिश किया गया तो आगे के आ, आ, आज के बातचीत में हम इंग्लिश में बात करेंगे लेकिन इस इंटरव्यू का एक हिंदी अनुवाद संक्षिप्त में हमारे नए वेबसाइट कलेक्टिव डैश इंडिया डॉट कॉम पर आप देख सकते तो टुडे विथ अस वी हैव प्रोफेसर डोंगपिंग हान प्रोफेसर टीचर इन नॉर्थ कैरोलिना यूएसए एंड टुडे वी आर डिस्कसिंग द अनोन कल्चरल रेवल्यूशन Uh, Professor Dong Ping has published the Unknown Cultural Revolution uh, in 2008, brought out by Monthly Review Press. And today we will be discussing the question of what an alternative education system can look like. Uh, uh, Professor has lived through the Cultural Revolution himself uh, as a young man in Jimo County in China, and the book Unknown Cultural Revolution: Life and Change in a Chinese Village. Combined reflections from the author's own experience, as well as carefully compiled data and statistics from district records. So, without going into more uh, details, uh, we'll begin today's interview uh, with the first question for Professor Dongfei. In chapter two of the book, "Rural Education: Unfulfilled Promises," uh, Professor Dongfei writes, "As early as 1926." The Communist Party of China Hunan Provincial Committee, in a declaration entitled "The Minimum Political and Economic Demands of the Peasantry," demanded free universal education on behalf of the rural poor. The rural poor, the Congress declared, bore the cost of education, but they were deprived of educational opportunities. Professor, could you share what was the situation of primary and higher education in pre- and post-revolutionary China? before the proletarian culture uh in 1949 when the chinese comes party came to power in 1949 india became independent in 1947 china and india was actually in very similar situation as far as education and uh, life expectancy and economic development india is a little bit ahead of china actually for some reason okay so in chinese rural area in 1949 uh the people's life expectancy was 32 years about uh, very similar to india and uh, the literacy rate was very very low in china The national average was about ten uh, percent literate, and these people mostly live in urban area, in the countryside. Most farmers were illiterate. My own parents never been to school. My father learned how to read and write in the 
at night school, sponsored by the Communist Party up to 1949. My mom never learned how to read and write her own name. He actually didn't know how, how to read the, the numbers in the money. I remember very, very interesting conversation between my mom and her neighbor. And the neighbor asked her, how did you recognize the, 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 the dollar, the dollar, the money bills? How do you differentiate the one dollar from the two dollar, three dollar, five dollar? My mom said, the color is different. <laughs> the, 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 the one you are is a red. The two year is green, right? And the five bill is, is a pink. Oh, I realized my mom even didn't know one, two, three, four. He just buy the color to tell which bill is which bill, right? Well, just like that. So then the Chinese Communist Party sponsored a land reform in China. So every poor farmer in the village got equal share of land. That's tremendously important. So everybody could produce his own food, right? He never had that, but China had that economically. So there were nobody were able to employ to work. We didn't have a landlord. We didn't everybody. So that's a very, very big thing, right? But education-wise, was still controlled by the elite. So in the in the in the in my hometown, for example, the school was still controlled by the educated elite. So the rural education, even though the common came to power, even though more demanded education reform in the countryside, but it was never realized. Right? So education in the rural area continued to struggle. And most farmers were not able to go to school because there were not enough space. My village and uh, several other primary school, and this primary school has only four grades. And each class had one, in the beginning, just one class. When I was uh, five or six years old, the first year, the first grade, finally increased to two classes. And in order for children to go to school, you need to pass exam. <laughs> Before they went to school, they need to pass exam. And many farmer children cannot pass the exam. And so they were done in school. And uh, during the cultural years, Mao called on the Chinese young people and called the Chinese farmers and workers to reform the educational system. And uh, the reform started by the, 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 the Red Guards, the red, educated Red Guards, uh, usually middle school and high school students. And uh, they rebelled against the educational authorities. And eventually more called on the Chinese farmers in the countryside to take charge of the schools, to the, the, take over the management of the schools from the teachers. And, and uh, the middle school, high school were managed by the workers team, workers and the workers from the county's uh, state-owned enterprise sent representatives together with the PLA soldiers and uh, went to school and the took over the management. So you mentioned how there was huge illiteracy, uh, not just in terms of the quantity of schools, but also in terms of the quality of what was taught and how relevant that was for the people. So in the fifth chapter of your book on rural yes. educational reform yes, yes. during the Cultural Revolution, you write that the central guidelines established by yes. Mao at the beginning of the movement contained in the Central Committee's May 16, 1966 decision on the Cultural Revolution stated that the task of the Cultural Revolution is to reform the old educational system and educational philosophy and methodology. Uh, so could you uh, give some specifics of what exactly yes. were the reforms that were made? 
and how was that connected to the philosophy of the culture okay in the beginning uh, we did have schools so the first step was to build schools so the first thing we did is every village the farmers build their own primary school so every school has every village has a primary school from first grade to fifth grade and every farmers children were able to go to this school the number one the first thing the second thing we did we set up more middle school so about four villages form a middle school they build a middle school so the graduates of primary school children from four four villages were able to go to this middle school free and the number three is the high school and before the corporation there were only one high school in the whole county and by the time the corporation ended in 1976 we had 89 high schools so every commune on average had three high schools when i went to high school in 1972 and uh, there were only 70% of high of middle school graduates were able to go to high school. The next year when my younger sister graduated from middle school, everybody 100% were able to go to high school free of charge. So the first thing was expansion. Everybody was entitled to our education 100%. And if you didn't send your to your children to school, then the village had a problem with you right you have no reason not to send your children why because it's free right you don't need to, your children to do anything else you have to go so everybody send their children to school it's a social club is like that right that's number one we have from one middle school for there were only seven seven middle school in Jima county at the time by the end of the country we have 249 so from seven to 249 from one high school one high school to 89 high school the expansion was great it's unbelievable big everybody was able to go to school that's number one number two the style the methodology has completely changed So before the cultural revolution education was centered around the teachers the teacher's voice is dominating the classroom not students were not allowed to talk the teacher was standing in the in front was telling students every day but at the beginning of the cultural revolution this changed the teacher cannot be dominant anymore and the students were organized into small groups and they will discuss the the, the 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 instruction materials in small groups and they sometimes take turns to teach in the classroom i remember i taught my first class with my group in the class uh in 1969 i taught you see the chairman moss uh, uh article serve the people and uh, the teacher provided pure provided our group some reference materials and we studied the history the social context when the article was written and what's the meaning of the, the, the article we had a wonderful discussion i so many years 57 years old i'm 67 years old now i i did that when i was 11 years old but i still remember it remember that day right so the teach, student involvement in the classroom in the teaching became great much much bigger okay all the stuff we taught in the classroom changed before the cultural revolution was mostly nationalized standardized textbook but during the cultural revolution years we have more localized material and uh, the teachers the students the farmers have impulse what should be taught in the classroom 
right? And uh, farming was taught in the classroom, how to plant uh, different crops at what time, and the fertilizer, why they are important, and what kind of fertilizer, uh, these kind of things were taught. We were taught in, taught industrial skills and how to make uh, um, uh, products with cast iron, how to make a model first, how to eventually make a, make a, make, make a mold and the cast uh, melted iron into the mold and make a products. So in the, in the middle school, I was studying at the time. We had a small farm. We had a factory. And we have a biological lab. And to make, uh, to experiment and to test different ways to make, uh, organic fertilizer, uh, for the crops. And we also go to factories and, uh, we do work in the factory as, as a class. I learn how the industrial skills. And we also invited farmers, workers into the classroom to tell students and uh, what their work was like. And uh, so we learned a lot from uh, people who has a practical experience. We go out to school to, to do a lot of things. So the study is no longer limited to the classroom. So we call it open door education at the time. We go out, we invite farmers, workers, soldiers to, into the classroom. So the teaching, the education became very, very broad based. It's very, very exciting. We're looking forward to new things every day. And the students took uh, leadership in managing the factory, the lab, and things like that. So each class has small experiment field. And we plant crops and we learn how to experiment with different crops, with different fertilizer, things like that. So the, cons the educated company transformed. Uh, so my next question was actually about this. So you mentioned that it just it wasn't just the uh, expansion of school, which also did take place between 1966 and 76, but also what was taught inside the school that changed. So you had manual and mental labor being brought in together. And um, you, in your book, you also mention about how certain centralized exams uh, were dropped to allow more students from rural backgrounds to enter higher education. So how was the divide between the urban and the rural education system? Uh, how was that overcome? Yeah, the that's why we're important part. So in the old days, Everybody studied the same textbook. So the textbook was very, very uh, centralized on the urban life. So what was the most important for the urban people? And uh, the things the farmers knew were not taught. The things the farmers need were not taught. So the rural people was very, very much you know, where were disadvantages position. And now the stuff we taught in the classroom was very, very close related to the farmer's life. Right? The seed, read the season, knew the soil, knew the crops. It's what the farmers knew. Farmers started very early on to work in the fields with their family. And they knew this stuff they, they, they are much better to learning this stuff for them. It's because it's connected with their lives. So there were no national standardized exam anymore. Right? There were some tests, quizzes, was, was local. Was, uh, actually there were no national exam anymore during the cultural years. And, uh, the teacher decide what kind of test they gave. And the test was never weighted very, very heavily. And uh, the folks were, were on the student learning. Uh, the, 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 the aim, the objective, to let students learn, but not to test students. And uh, no over-test at all. 
I don't remember much of the, 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 the examination or test. Everybody passed, right? Uh, most of the test was, was a group oriented. So we were given a project and the group of students worked together to solve the problem. So the whole idea to empower students to analyze a practical problem and find a practical solution to the problem. So the focus is on training students' ability to analyze an important problem and find solution collectively. So I think that's the, the main uh, focus on the education during the cultural year. That's where the next question was also coming. Uh, you also write in your book that the emerging democratic culture of the Cultural Revolution empowered rebels and ordinary people. They began to challenge aspects of China's traditional culture of official depth, demanding that party leaders conform to the aesthetic Maoist code of official conduct. So my question is that in the reforms that were made during the Cultural Revolution years, what was the role of the political initiative of the people and particularly of the student and the youth? in changing both education as well as society at large. When I was uh, teaching of about 10 years ago, uh, I received a call from uh, a professor from uh, Vancouver, Canada. He invited me to give a talk uh, in his university. And uh, Simon Fraser University, I agree. I thought he was uh, somebody who taught about China. But when I go there, I find out he was not teaching anything about China. He was an Indian professor. He graduated from Harvard. He's a sociology professor. And uh, so I asked him the question, why you want to, you bother to invite me, a Chinese? And uh, uh, somebody who was writing about China mostly. He said he wanted to find out why the Indian and the civilization produce somebody like Gandhi, right? And uh, the Chinese civilization produced somebody like Chairman Mao. And who led the Chinese people to rise up and uh, fought with the imperialists and eventually liberal, liberated the Chinese people. So he asked me, he said his objective, he inviting me to talk to, to his students. So I, I think if you want to understand why China eventually became what it is today, you have to trace back to Chairman Mao's reading about China, about the world. And uh, Mao is the greatest leader of our oppressed people in the world. Mao was fighting for the oppressed, for the poor, for the disadvantaged. You know, for the 90%, right? In America, we have a movement called you see, 1% against 99%. That's what Mao was fighting for. And Mao, of course, influenced many, many people in the small, rich, powerful they come over to his cause. So together, he won the cause in China. So Mo wrote many, many powerful articles. He made many, many powerful speeches, like serving the people. These are very, very powerful speeches. They set the tone and the foundation for China's political culture. He called on the Chinese officials to serve the people. You were not above the people. You were people's servant. In the West, we call it in India, we call it public servants. But that's only a rhetoric. It's never enforced, right? The officials in the West, in America, in India, always live the life above the common people. But in China, in the countryside, including Chinese Deputy Prime Minister, 
Che Yun Wei, and many, many others, they don't make a salary. They were paid like farmers in work points. Before the Cultural Revolution, the Chinese common people didn't know what Mo said or wrote. <laughs> they didn't know. But at the, at the beginning of the Cultural Revolution, the farmers, even including people like my, my mom, who didn't know how to read and write, were taught by people like me. I read Mo's writing to her. I read, I read Mo's writing to other neighbors. You know, this, look, this is what Mo Chen Mo said. Officials need to work with the people. They need to serve the people. If people have some need, they need to solve the problem. They cannot push people around. That's the most powerful thing happened in Chinese society. Everybody knew what Chairman Mao said. You know, in my book, I mentioned about the, 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 the American comedy, uh, the diplomatic uh, protocol, right? Writing an American woman didn't know anything about the Constitution. And finally, one day, he read the Constitution. He felt empowered and they began to challenge the officials. That's what happened during the country years. In my village, there was a 72-year-old illiterate man. Everybody looked down upon him. He was not married. He was poor all, her life, all his life. Nobody gave a shit to him. He worked in the fields every day. But nobody cared about him. But during the country years, he learned how to recite Chairman Mao's writings. He was able to recite all Chairman Mao's three most important writings. And everybody had to change the attitude towards him. He became famous. He was able to recite Chairman Mao's writing in the, in the big mass meetings. And finally, people realize how to respect him and others. So with that, the, the, the moment to study Chen Mo's writings, God, the farmer demanding the official to work with them. The farmer demanding, right? We come to work every day with them. And the uh, official were elected at the end of the year. If you did a good job, you got elected. If you didn't, somebody else would take place. It take his place. So we had a change of political culture. That's where I think the last question for today also comes in. Uh, there was a huge transformation that happened during the Cultural Revolution. And I think from what you are saying, uh, the changes that took place in education could only take place because of the huge politicization of society that happened and the big collective farms and the big uh, economic ambitious projects that were taken during the same year. Uh, so in the book, you write that in the, la in the chapter 9, negating the cultural revolution, in the decade after Deng came to power, rural schools were closed on a large scale and school attendance dropped precipitously. The sharp contraction of rural education was due both to the new central education policy, it was decided to close poor quality rural middle schools, and to the dismantling of rural collectives, which were the main <coughs> <coughs> sorry, uh, which were the main economic support of the rural school system. So despite continuing economic growth since Deng came to power, far fewer rural children now have the opportunity to go to school. So my question is that could you describe what was the effect of revoking the Cultural Revolution? Today the Cultural Revolution is discussed in China as a shameful period in Chinese history and the officials say that the Cultural Revolution destroyed education for a number of years. But you disagree with that analysis. So, what do you think was the uh, what yeah. has changed since the cultural revolution? The, the 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 West interest, the people in power, the elites, 
They didn't want to change. Because any change will threaten their comfort, their power, their privilege. That's no doubt. The same thing in India, the same thing in China, the same thing in the U.S., right? The people who are already in power <laughs> didn't want change. But Mao was so powerful. Mao mobilized the Chinese ordinary people to fight against the elites. So when Mao died, the old elites led by Deng Xiaoping managed to come back. Of course, they want to destroy the cultural revolution because they destroy their privilege. That's very, very understandable. You don't need to be angry. You just need to understand. That's what they do. So the teachers in China using the rising power of the conservative, Deng Xiaoping and old officials, right? They basically destroyed Chairman Mao's legacy. I think I can tell you with confidence, China will continue to rise. The cultural Russian mindset will return. That's the only way China will continue to make progress. We cannot allow the small elites to dominate, to dictate to the poor people how they can live. That's the only way. I mean, I think, I think what, what I always want to give to you is, if you want to do something important to change what's going on in India or in the world, you need to integrate with working class. You just cannot, just students. You have to work with workers, farmers. You have to join force with the masses. The more, Chairman Mao has been calling on the Chinese young people to do that. And the Chinese Communist Party succeeded partly because the intellectuals were no longer limit themselves in the school. They go out. They join a force with workers, farmers, and they were strengthened by the masses. Uh, you mentioned in your book that in the final analysis, the quality of education has to be measured by how much students have learned and how useful students' knowledge is for society, rather than by how many students succeed in getting into colleges. So I think the political message of the culture, yes. yeah. uh, that is something that is inspiring even today, not just in China, but across the world for anyone who dreams of uh, transforming society, giving it a revolutionary direction. So from Collective, I would like to thank you for sharing yes. your time with us today and for answering these questions. I hope the audience will uh, stay with us and keep joining these conversations again and again.